Piece first half retrospective and review. I know you all just want me to get to the time skip, but I think it's important to look back at what we've seen so far before moving forward. I've taken all of your suggestions for talking points and tried to compile them into this one video. So let's just get to it already. We're here because we know One Piece is good, and you don't have to have me convince you that this is true. Everyone who enjoys this show is drawn to it for a different reason. The thing about One Piece is that it's so broad in all of its messages that it can be appealing to most demographics. Personally, I love the multitude of universes that are created for each new location. I find that so much care and so much thought goes into the creation of each place before we even arrive there. We saw this somewhat in the East Blue Saga when the islands were fairly standard. Something about a floating sea restaurant is given so much character and so much personality that it's not just a floating sea restaurant. The place where we really get to see the upgrade of locations is, of course, after we enter the Grand Line. With each passing arc, they get better and better as we learn about each new location. Alabasta was a desert island, but it had history and different cities, and in some cases, lingo. Water 7 was amazing because it turned something that was half our city is underwater and made it into a culture. Even man-made places like Impel Down had a natural feel to it, like it's been there for a very long time. The creativity of One Piece really shows when you look at strictly the landscapes. But you can also see that incredible creativity when you stop and look at the characters as well. Putting the main crew on the back burner for just a minute, we get brand new characters the start of each arc. The slate is cleaned and a new group of people come into our lives. And these people are always fun and unique and most importantly of all, relevant. Each character is carefully introduced and crafted so that every move they make leads towards the resolution that they will assist with. It's kind of hypnotizing when you realize why we've met each guy, even if it was hundreds of episodes later. I think everyone's favorite example of this is Laboon whose payoff took about 300 episodes of slow cooking. But that feeling we get when Kokoro shows up in the train, or Hachi takes them around in Shabandi, or that guy was Luffy's dad the whole time, is just awesome. Even on smaller scales, it's great for each character to fulfill their purpose. If you look at it just within an arc, it's almost the same sense of satisfaction. For example, you can look back as early as the Captain Kuro arc to see that there are gratifying moments for characters introduced at the beginning to come back at the end. Usopp has his little friends at the beginning, but they don't just go away! They go back to rescue Kaya, and then they bring Kaya to help fight against Kuro! This simple character gratification really shows the excellent pattern that we've come to expect from One Piece. Who thought the Kung Fu Dugongs were going to come back? Who expected the Knight of the Sky to be so relevant? And who expected Iceberg to be the one to fix up the Going Merry so that it could go and rescue the crew? Thinking back to those moments never get old. It's all sort of legendary. Now, the B cast of One Piece is obviously very, very strong, as I've just finished establishing. But we don't watch One Piece for Konis or Koza or Polly. We watch One Piece for our main characters, the ones that we've adventured with from the beginning. As I've demonstrated previously, I do have an order of favorites, but I can honestly say that there isn't a member of the crew that I dislike. And that says a lot about the show, when all of the main characters are likable. And they're also so different, so they give us different reasons to like them too. They're memorable without being gimmicky. Their motivations all have something to do with a very basic human need. A dream. Everyone has something they want so badly that they would fight if it was taken away. Personally, I have no desire to draw a map of the world or find an ocean where all of the fish of the world coexist peacefully. But I understand the sentiment of desire and want. I can get it and so I can relate. And the good thing about the crew is that they're the same way. The only one who wants to be an awesome doctor is Chopper, but the rest of the crew wants him to be that as well. And when I first started watching the show, I thought that they all didn't care about each other's dreams because they were looking out for their own dream. And maybe back then I was right. Traveling together has brought that out of them, and helping their Nakama fulfill their dreams has become a part of each crew's dream as well. 
The word Nakama is so very important in One Piece. The backbone of the adventure is that we're all going to get through it together. Strength in numbers, rather than separately. As viewers, we know that the crew thrives when they're working together. At the beginning of an arc, generally everyone disperses and then eventually comes back together by the end. And when they do come back together, that's when the magic happens. That's why it was so very difficult to stomach the events of the Shabandi arc. Because at the end, everyone was so very far apart from one another, it was just heartbreaking. How can the show be about working together when there's no one to work together with? Well, actually, just about everyone managed to recruit a replacement Nakama as they strove to get back together with the original one that they had. And as they all resolved to work harder, to make themselves stronger for two years, we can really see how much they've grown as a crew, even though they're apart. I've already talked about it extensively, the crew's evolution, in a separate video, so I'm not going to go into it now. But the fact that they're all dedicated to each other and to Luffy is really quite enough to demonstrate this. Okay, and now we have our villains. One Piece villains are great because there are so many different types of them. We have villains who are evil, who circumstantially end up fighting as the Mugiwara crew because of timing. Then we have villains who are noble and oppose the Mugiwara crew because it's part of their job and they believe that they are doing their best to protect the world from the evil of piracy. Then there are villains who don't specifically even target them, but then just kind of end up as third-party competitors. So basically we have the marines, like Smoker, Akainu, and Garp. Then we have other villains who are competing for One Piece, like Law, or Kid, or Blackbeard. Then there are in-betweeners, like the Shichibukai, like Mihawk and Moria. But arc to arc, there are also big bads at the end, like all of the numbered agents in the Baroque Works saga, Enel, and just about everyone from the East Blue Saga. It does get tough when someone falls into several of these categories, like Crocodile, who even wound up being an ally somehow. But the consistent thing about One Piece antagonists is that they're always focused. There's never any question as to what they're doing or why they're doing it. The villains don't waver, they don't have a change of heart, and they don't doubt their actions. Henchmen certainly do, which is always a treat but the big bad battles are always 100%. This means it's so easy to look forward to the boss fights. It always delivers and it's always intense, even if it does take a little while to build towards it. Now I've talked about the characters taking a long time to get some gratification, but in addition, plot points can also take a long time to mature as well. Prime example of this is the concept of Haki. I firmly believe that we got our first introduction to Haki back in the Buggy the Clown arc, when Luffy had his flashback of Shanks staring down that sea monster. 500 episodes later, we get an explanation. But in that time, we got hints constantly dropped, just reminding us that there's something going on in the background. The hints became more and more profound as each arc progressed, and we finally learned that we could call it by a name. It's difficult to pinpoint exactly when we were able to connect all of these strange occurrences and root them all back to this one phenomenon. But we saw Luffy use it in Amazon Lily, and they all knew what they were looking at. We learned that Shanks had done it, and Rayleigh had done it, and holy shit, it was up in Skypea too! The explanation of Haki was great because finally there were guidelines for what we're supposed to look out for. And Haki is so very important to have in a universe like One Piece where everything is dominated by magic powers. Because as far as we know, Roger didn't have a Devil Fruit ability, so how the hell was he able to become Pirate King? Oh, because of the Haki. This demonstrates that it's not the magical power you acquire that makes you special, Blackbeard. It's what's inside of you and what you're born with. You don't have to wait around for that awesome devil fruit. You just have to take what you already have and make it better. Now, One Piece also has so many running themes that keep popping up. But an important one is definitely being able to rise up above your past trauma and keep pressing forward. It's essential to not forget or run away from the past. Rather, you have to take the events from the past, no matter how terrible they are, and use them in order to get stronger. Every One Piece flashback is tragic. Each member of the crew has experienced something terrible that they're using to help fulfill their dreams. I think this is a great way to look at it because it shows that no matter how bad things seem, 
you have to make them better. Luffy's flashback showed the traumatic loss of a friend and a brother. Instead of becoming afraid of hardship and adventure, he and Ace used that in order to inspire them. Zoro experienced a similar loss in his childhood that could have made him lose his spunk and tenacity. He used Kuina's death to make him even stronger than he would have been if she had lived. Usopp's dad abandoned him, and instead of becoming resentful like he would have been justified in doing, he instead admired that and chose to emulate that. Nami witnessed her mother's death and was subsequently made a slave. Chopper was outcasted his entire life and the only person who ever cared for him exploded. Sanji almost died of starvation and he was also probably an orphan. Frankie inadvertently led to his foster father's execution and he was hit by a train. Everyone Robin knew was killed needlessly and she had to live as a criminal. And all of Brooke's friends died and he was isolated for 50 years. Now the crew took those traumas and used them to shape their personalities into something even stronger. Something admirable and powerful rather than tragic or pathetic. Now the first half of One Piece itself is a saga. It tells a story of triumph and success but also that of failure. In the end, Luffy and his crew failed. They lost. Regardless of how many enemies they defeated in the past, the fact of the matter was simply that they're just not good enough. Nobody cares about how much you want to win. If you're not strong enough to take your dream, then you might as well just turn around. This is what we saw at the very end. Thankfully, the crew is dedicated enough to each other and to their dreams that we are able to have a second half of One Piece. Obviously, they'll come back from this better than before and ready to take that thing that they want. And I think it was a good idea to approach the second half of One Piece in this way. Before, they weren't good enough, but you just watch them now. Of course, they're not perfect yet. And there's still a long way we have to go in order to achieve our dreams and get One Piece. But now it's possible, and the story can happen organically. All I've talked about so far is One Piece as a story and an experience. But there's a lot more to it, like the mechanics of the show. For example, the opening and ending theme songs. All in all, the openings and endings were very good, and there isn't really one that I look back at with disappointment. Some are definitely better than others, but each has their own charm. Whether it's the song, or the images, or just the memory of where we were in the series when they were using that particular song, it's fun to listen to all of them. Regardless of the reasons, we can all look fondly back at each one of them. I do have a video coming out about my top five opening theme songs, so I won't go into it now. Another mechanical aspect of the show is animation. Frankly, I'm a little surprised that more effort doesn't go into animating this show that is clearly so big and has so much money. Some episodes just look downright lazy, and I don't think that's fair. But in all fairness, it is good enough, and the episodes do have to be released weekly. And, of course, we do have the problem with pacing and filler content. But, uh, that's been talked about to death. Not only by me, but by everyone else in the world. It's bad. We're sad. Get past it. Okay, so that was the first half of One Piece. You guys really wanted to hear my predictions for the next half, but I'm too reluctant to do that because I always worry that someone will confirm that prediction which is a spoiler. And I know this is gonna sound crazy, but sometimes when my predictions are right, people accuse me of watching One Piece before and <laughs> pretending to make the predictions and pretending to watch the show for the first time. I know, it's incredibly ludicrous, but people have accused me of doing that several times, actually. So I won't do predictions until I'm all caught up. Sorry. Next up for my One Piece schedule, I'll be watching just episode 517 alone. And this is an episode that I have seen once before, a very long time ago when it first came out, before I started watching from the beginning. And then I'll examine the remainder of the Return to Shibandi arc. My proposed Fishman Island arc schedule is in the description, so let me know if there are any tweaks I should make. I'll see you next time when I start the second half of One Piece! Bye!